God bless you. God bless you. Amen. It's so good to see, amen, all of you this morning, uh, the few that are here, uh, our leaders that are here in person, and you that are watching on our virtual. We are so blessed to have you gathering with us one more time. Listen, we are certainly living in uh, some moments where the, the cascading of trauma and trouble uh, can be so overwhelming for all of us, uh, and we do not count it for granted that uh, we are not all impacted in various kinds of ways. And so certainly I feel the, the message arc for this season around healing and restoration about what does it mean for us as a people of followers of Jesus to literally lean into being restored is so apropos in so many different kinds of ways. And so I invite you that are watching with us to, to uh, prepare to take some notes and to think a little bit about uh, how our act and our journey and our arc towards restoration can actually be a pathway and a journey for others to participate in their own restoration as well. Uh, we are now uh, entering a, a phase and a time uh, where the meta uh, challenge of our, of our time around coronavirus uh, is now reaching such a different phase. We are finding now that uh, coronavirus is, is, is um, uh, I, I was speaking to someone the other day and I, I tried to explain to them uh, using a scripture where Jesus says that the devil is like a roaring lion uh, uh, seeking whom he may devour. And that's what coronavirus is. Uh, we now have vaccination rates that are uh, somewhat uh, significant across the board, but in black uh, communities in particular, we are the least vaccinated. And we, I, it appears to me, we seem to be the most vulnerable uh, to conspiracy theories, falsehoods, and uh, um, 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 uh, straw men arguments. And I, I want to just proclaim to all of us that uh, there are many reasons why uh, I know folks are hesitant around vaccines. I was hesitant around the vaccine. I did not get my first shot until the end of March. And uh, I was one of these folk that used to joke around. I said, you know, when, when Noah uh, came back from the flood and uh, he sent out them birds. Bible, any Bible students up in here? He sent out the birds. <laughs> and the first bird went out and it came back. And then it, it, it communicated to Noah that it, it wasn't safe out here yet. So we sent out a second bird. <laughs> and that second bird went out, came back. You know, it ain't, it ain't, well, I, I was saying publicly, well, I'm gonna be like that fourth bird. Somebody say, man, I'm not gonna be the first bird out here. <laughs> so you're not talking to somebody who is not aware of the hesitancy of the historical legacy of the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and the ways in which uh, uh, our communities have been disproportionately targeted uh, with uh, bad medicine and bad treatment by the medical industry. But I will say to us that uh, you that are hesitant because you are worried about uh, disparate impacts of the vaccine as a conspiracy. I'm not talking to folks who have uh, you know medical reasons for not taking the vaccine. I'm talking about folk who have in their mind been traumatized or psychologically convinced that something uh, disparate is going to happen to you should you take this very preventive uh, medical intervention. I just, wanna, I just wanna continue to invite you to please seek out a medical professional that you trust and talk it over with them. Now, I'm certainly going to encourage everyone to take the vaccine because I do believe that all of the evidence by medical professionals, I'm not talking about uh, the unknown uh, YouTube person who probably didn't pass biology. I'm not talking about the bad theologian who's trying to convince you that it's going to change your DNA or it's the mark of the beast or you got nanoparticles running through your body. I'm not talking about them folks. I mean, you can talk to them, but I would not base my life on people who have not figured out a specialization. I wish I could talk to somebody up in here. 
And I'm not trying to be hard. I know there are some folks, even in our congregation, who have very uh, philosophical differences around vaccines and have hesitancy. And, and I, I, I have much compassion towards you. Uh, but I know in the last two weeks, I have personally been notified of at least a dozen individuals who have literally died from the coronavirus. Most of them have been black men, musicians, artists who have not believed that it is a, a, a way to protect yourself from serious illness and even perhaps death. And so I want to invite you all, please definitely eat healthier, go for walks, take your vitamins, turmeric, all that stuff. Get all the herbs in your body. Do all of that. I'm not telling you not to do that either. Somebody say man. But folk I know who are having a hard time with this virus have done all of that, and their organs have not been able to withstand the onslaught of this novel. Novel means that it is unique. It's never been seen before. It is something that we are still trying to understand. Novel. Somebody say man. And so I, 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 the reason we have not re uh, convened as a congregation is because the novel coronavirus that is now a Delta variant is more contagious and among our communities because we are not vaccinated the virus does not attach as quickly to vaccinated individuals as it does to unvaccinated individuals and so it is irresponsible for me as a pastor I don't know about anybody else to try to cram all us back in our, our, our beautiful facility while I know many of us are still carrying some of the hesitation. And so uh, it, is, it, is, it is spiking all across the country uh, and in many parts of the world. Uh, I was reading uh, this morning or last night that they believe now the pandemic will now move to an endemic, which means that rather than it being globally or universally um, uh, a problem, it will now become a problem in particular locations. Which means that the communities that have the least vaccination rates will likely be the communities that will have this issue most persisting. And how many know those are our communities? This vaccine, I mean, this 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 uh, coronavirus now is 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 impacting our children much more. My daughter went back to school this past week, and on the first day, they already had uh, a notification sent out to parents that someone had tested positive. The the Oakland school district still does not have what I believe the proper protocols in place, and so I need us all to pray, but I also need us to act. If you refuse still to uh, participate or take the the vaccine, please don't do the kind of activities that vaccinated people are doing. You got to continue to be careful. Stay at home, shelter in place. Don't be moving around here among crowds of people uh, who still won't wear their mask, who still won't wash their hands, who still will act, just act as if uh, uh, we are not living in some difficult times. If you one of these folk who smoke weed and and, and, and sip, sip, puff, puff, pass. Don't share your weed or your drink. I'm trying to help somebody live up in here now. Uh, I, I, I would that you'd stop doing all that altogether. But if, if you must partake, don't share it with nobody. Do not trust folk around you. Because some folk, uh, are, I believe, are... are, are, are um, overwhelmed with a lot of misinformation or anxiety. And even with all of that, we still have all kinds of issues. That's what we're gonna talk about a little bit today. We're gonna to talk about uh, what does it mean for us to be a people who create or build systems that facilitate both the healing and restoration of our communities. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the text is gonna come from 2 Corinthians chapter number one. We're going to read verses 3 through 11, and I, I'm, 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 I'm compelled by this passage. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul is writing to 
the church in Corinth. This is one of the Apostle Paul's most uh, favorite uh, but uh, tenuous congregations, uh, mostly because uh, he has to continue to write to them and remind them uh, that uh, not only is he worthy to be their spiritual leader, but they are also called to be in an active partnership with him to create healthy church and Christian community. That how many of you know a healthy community does not happen by accident, but it is a result of intentionality. And you and I must constantly remind ourselves that we are being called to participate with God, to create and build that which emanates from a source that will never run out. Healing, the art and the act of being restored emanates from a source that will never run out. And this is the great gift, I believe, of Christian faith to us, is that we are connected to a source that will never run out. Oh, you ought to just, you ought to just, amen, just put in the chat or lift up your hands real quick and say, I thank God my healing and restoration never runs out. Because there are times where I have, think I may have exhausted it all. Do I have any folk in here that felt like you tapped all of your healing and restoration dry? And you, you, the, more you, the more you walked with God and the more you hung out with God, you realize, man, I could keep coming back for more and more and more. And every time I come back for more, there's a new lesson, a new anointing, a new, a new gift that gets unlocked in my life. So, 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 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 3, the words of Scripture simply, I'm reading from the message translation, it goes like this, all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. The message is fascinating because it calls God the God of all healing counsel. That there is a, 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 a reservoir of knowledge and wisdom that, 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 that helps to inform how we are healed, how we are restored. And guess what? God is in charge of all of that. God comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, God brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no more so than the good times of God's healing comfort. We get a full measure of that, too. Yes, yes. Verse number six. When we suffer for Jesus, it works out for your healing and salvation. If we are treated well, given a helping hand and encouraging word, that also works to your benefit. Spurring you on, face forward, unflinching. Your hard times are also our hard times. When we see that you're just as willing to endure the hard times as to enjoy the good times, we know you're going to make it. No doubt about it. Verse number eight. We don't want you in the dark, friends, about how hard it was when all this came down on us in Asia province. It was so bad we didn't think we were going to make it. We felt like we'd been sent to death row that it was all over for us. And as it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened. Woo. Lord, my God. Instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out, we were forced to trust God totally. It's not a bad idea since God is the God who raises the dead. And God did it. Somebody say God did it. Rescued us from certain doom. And God will do it again. 
Man, I should have made that the sermon title. Amen. You ought to just put it in your chat. The, 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 the secondary sermon title is God will do it again. Rescuing us as many times as we need rescuing. You and your prayers are part of the rescue operation. I don't want you in the dark about that either. I can see your faces even now lifted in praise for God's deliverance of all, a rescue in which your prayers played such a crucial part. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be unto God. Amen. I want us to uh, consider the title, There's More Where That Came From. There's more where that came from. Why? Why do we need to know there's more where that came from? Because as we are moving through this very difficult season, uh, it is not lost upon me that the faith, the courage, the belief, the love, the compassion of many is growing cold. I mean, I even have to guard my own heart as we navigate through this season because I have a frustration level that uh, can easily uh, override my compassion level. I was talking with a mentor, and he told me, you know, was giving me some counsel as I was trying to make some decisions, and he said, you know, uh, Mike, uh, one of the, the most uh, fascinating um, uh, 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 paradoxes of your leadership style is that you have a deep well of compassion for the hurting, but a short fuse for those who you believe are causing the hurt. And so it is easy when we're in meetings <laughs> and people are not agreeing with your way of compassion, you don't have a poker face. It becomes obvious in meetings, you know, you don't cuss folk out, you don't yell, you don't scream, but folk know when Pastor Mike in the meeting is reaching a breaking point. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And, 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 you know, I've been thinking about that uh, particularly because I know that for many of us in our places of life and relationship and vocation and work and and neighborhood we are literally bumping up against one could argue multiple breaking points and 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 the loss that we have all experienced over the last year or so is unprecedented in our current generation I was uh, looking at um, some urban planners and, 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 and they were talking about how one of the greatest losses of this current coronavirus era is the loss of what they called a third place. And, and, and a third place is this kind of notion that urban designers use, uh, urban planners use to, to talk about uh, the places where people spend time besides home and work that help them receive the kind of love, affirmation, outlet, stability that is necessary for a full, well-rounded social life. And once the pandemic literally shut down everything. Shut down churches, shut down malls, shut down parks, shut down schools. It literally shut down what the uh, urban designers have called the third places. And people have had to recreate third places that uh, have become artificial spaces for what I would call uh, 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 healing and social life that is substandard. Because how many of you know not every place you go is a 
high quality place. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, you know, uh, you food connoisseurs up in here, when, when you're in another city and you're trying to figure out where to go eat, you just don't pull off on any old kind of, you know, side restaurant. If you've not ate at that restaurant, some of you pull up Urban Spoon. You pull up, you know, the review places. Why? Because you want to see what do other people have to say about this place. You, 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 you want to understand, are the reviews of this place worthy of my investment of my money and my time and my company? Not every place is created the same. Well, we in this pandemic have had to create third places. And these third places often live online. They are virtual. Uh, we know young people are consuming uh, social media at an all-time high. And we know that the consumption of that social media is, 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 is feeding all kinds of, of mental and social anxieties. And, and we ought not be surprised about that because before the pandemic, there were all kind of studies out about the way in which too much clicking on Facebook and clicking on Instagram and clicking on Twitter and Snapchat and, 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 and what's the other one? Uh, 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 TikTok. Lord, I wish I could cast out the demon of TikTok up in here. Man, that you literally click yourself into an echo chamber of both self-gratifying desires, but also a kind of erosion of your own well-being. Because much of the information curated in media and social media uh, is not conducive to creating a place of healing and restoration. Most of the time, it's amplifying that which you already don't have. I mean, one of the reasons why they took the, 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 uh, the number of likes off of the posts on Instagram is because they found that psychologically people were feeling inferior to others because a post they put on social media only had 10 likes. And someone else's post with the same information had hundreds of likes or thousands of likes. And now you start to feel like, well, I must be inferior because not as many people like an arbitrary post. I'm just trying to talk to somebody today about the places we must construct. Because in a time like now where death is still around us, we were uh, engaged in some meetings about the, the rise of gun violence in this region and across the country. And we sat in some meetings and we heard propaganda. I'm going to call it propaganda. We heard uh, 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 reckless claims that to the uninformed would make you stay in your house and not come outside. And as I sat there, just thinking about the painstaking work some of us have done over the last decade to construct healing and intervention and prevention strategies to make sure we keep our young brothers and sisters alive and free, that took some intentionality that did not happen by accident. And so my question to some of us is, as we are seeking healing and as we are seeking restoration, what kind of construction are we willing to do in both our personal lives, our families, our neighborhoods, our schools and our cities and the country and even the world? What kind of constructive work are we willing to do to design pathways for healing and restoration? Because as I stated before, healing and restoration is a result of a divine pathway. 
God has ordered pathways for us to be brought back into relationship with God. God has designed practices to help us facilitate healing of ourselves and others. It is not something that happens out of the blue. It happens by design. And when you and I can design healing and restoration, there's always more healing and restoration that can flow through a design than a one-off, ad hoc, haphazard expression or experience. I wonder if you can think about those times in your life where you realize, man, God created a design for me to help me recover from my worst moments in life. I don't know if you knew it was a design at the time. Some of us, you know, you know, sing that song, something got a hold of me. I went to a meeting one night and my heart wasn't right, but something got a hold to me. But guess what? Somebody had to design the meeting. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody. Somebody had to design you getting there. Mm -hmm. Someone even had to design uh, the way that you could stay and get the experience. None of these things happen by accident. They happen by design. And I want you, child of God, to be on the lookout for the designs of your healing and restoration. I want us to be architects of rest restoration and healing. I want you to be participants of restoration and healing designs. I don't want us to sit on the sideline and become consumers only of someone else's project that has proven to be insufficient to keep you and our people alive. Oh, make no mistake about it, some of our churches need to go through a redesigning process. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody today. Some of our discipleship processes need to go through a redesigning process. Some of our ordinations and some of our denominations and some of our preaching and teaching needs to go through a redesigning process. Why? Because if it does not facilitate healing in a pandemic, if it does not facilitate restoration in times of hardship, then I want to declare that your design is bankrupt. And God is never running out of healing and restoration. Somebody told me that person's too far gone. I said, for you. <laughs> uh huh. They too far gone for you. But how many of you know in the divine design of God, there ain't no too far for God. There's just right on time. Give your neighbor a fake high five and tell them they number some right on time. Now, now, in, in, in the text, uh, Paul is, is, is very powerfully trying to, to bring the Corinthian church into a consciousness of the way in which God designs healing and restoration. Paul is trying to help them to understand that it is not uh, uh, the case that you and I, Paul, in this text, are operating in silos. That, that, that the Corinthian church is not operating apart from Paul. Even though they may not be in the same place. Because Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church, which means that Paul is not currently in Corinth. So Paul is saying, even though we are separated by distance, I want you to know that we are still connected by purpose. We are still connected by design. And, and, and one of the things that Paul says that I think is so important in verse number four is it says that, listen, child of God, I want you to know that God comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, God brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. One of the first things that I believe is so important about the design of healing and restoration is that we should always look for reciprocity. We should always look for reciprocity, which means that 
there is always a continuing back and forth, a mutual giving between the receiver and the giver. When we have healing processes and restoration processes that are only one way, that is not indicative of the design of God. That God will heal you so you can in turn help facilitate the healing of others. In our relationships and in our life experiences, I want us as we navigate through the loss and the death and the illness and the sickness, the social upheaval, the displacement, the, the, the discre destruction of our third places, if you will. I want all of us to be people who are able to understand the ways in which God is trying to come alongside you so you can, in turn, come alongside someone else. So let's first deal with how do you know uh, that God is alongside you? Lord, help me, help me, help me. How, how do you know that God, I love, I love the language here, God comes alongside you. The, the anthropomorphic kind of image of God coming alongside you of God showing up alongside you, of God kind of walking. Anybody ever snuck up on somebody? You were anywhere ever trying to meet somebody out, you know, at a restaurant or a park, and they got there early, and you just kind of want to run up alongside them and just kind of like, you know, ever try to surprise them? You ever try to do that? Well, that's the image I have of God. In my worst moments, God is running up behind me to come alongside. Lord, have mercy. That, that God is trying to sneak up on you, show up when you least expect it to be your companion through your hard times. And when God shows up alongside you, God is coming to meet your need. When God shows up alongside you, God is coming to help you understand a process of healing and restoration. God is coming to help you construct a space and a place where healing and restoration can happen. God is coming to remind you that restoration and healing does not happen in a vacuum, but it happens when God comes alongside you. Lord, have mercy. It, 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 it's got to be such a blessing for we who have become convinced of this point that no matter what my life brings to me, God is going to come alongside me. It, it, it should animate the scripture where Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It should animate the scripture where David says, whether I make my bed in hell, you are there. Whether I look up and I'm in heaven, you are there. That wherever I am, God is coming alongside me. Lord, 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 Lord. Now, I, if you like me, pat yourself on the chest and say, God, I need you to show up today. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm looking to my left and my right. I don't see you. That's because God's probably carrying you right now. Or God's sneaking up, you know, kind of bobbing and weaving, trying to figure out a way to come and surprise you today. But the great thing about God is that God is always close to you. God is always proximal to you. Uh, when Jesus said uh, that if I dash my foot against a stone, God, Jesus is aware what? That God is alongside me. And I want you to know that, child of God. You are in a reciprocal relationship with God. That God is alongside you. And listen, God gives to us what you could never give God equitably in return. But it is the divine and sheer generosity of God where God only asks from us is our worship. God only asks from us is our obedience and our devotion. And listen, God asks for us then to come alongside somebody else. 
You ought to tell your neighbor, oh, I need to come alongside somebody else. In this pandemic, in this season of violence, whether we're talking about Haiti or East Oakland or your house or the schools, come alongside somebody. Because it is in the coming alongside someone, you may find God alongside you. It's kind of like, you know, you, you just creating a, 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 a chain, you know. Uh, uh, what, what do you call that? A, 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 a chain line. I mean, God's giving you mercy, and so you give someone else mercy. God's giving you grace, so you give someone else grace. God's giving you healing, so you give someone else healing. God's giving you restoration, so you give someone else restoration. Come alongside God and watch God come alongside you. So the question you must ask yourself where has God come alongside you in this season? Where has God come along? Has it been in your grief? Then guess what? It's time for you to seek out those who are grieving. Has it been in your wellness? Because some of us have had to change our wellness practices in this season. Has it been with your children? Because some of us who are raising kids right now know, oh, <laughs> these kids God gave me. Oh, they're a blessing now. Don't get me wrong. But I understand why it takes a village to raise a child. So where, where has God come alongside you and how must you come alongside someone else? Because it is in the coming alongside others following God coming alongside you where we're able to participate in the divine design of the reciprocal nature of healing and restoration somebody holler come alongside me God come alongside the second thing that I think the text lifts up that I want you and I to appreciate that there's more from where this came from when we lean into being a wounded healer. Somebody say, be a wounded healer. Verse number 10 is powerful. It says it like this, that you and your prayers are part of the rescue. Sometimes we think, because we're going through, that we now are only in the repair mode. And I'm not trying to, you know, put no extra burden on anybody. I want you to do self-care. I want you to, to, to be mindful of your limitations, your, your humanity. I want you to understand there are always seasons where, as Jesus had to pull away from the crowds to be in touch with God and, and make sure that, 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 that the will of God was being done in his life so he could serve those who God has called him to serve. How many know that even in those times and seasons of your own kind of of recharging and your own kind of self-care, that God is inviting you to think about the woundedness of your own self as a reservoir of the healing for others. That there are practices as a wounded healer that you can help codify. You can help articulate. A wounded healer is someone who has intentionality now around being a, a, a active healer versus a passive healer. You know, a passive person is if it just happens in the course of my life, then, you know, I'm going to have a word for somebody. If they come up and beg me, <laughs> if they ask me for the 10th time, do you know Jesus? And somebody say, man, if they ask me every day for a week, can you pray for me? Oh, I guess so. You pass. You a passive healer. I'm not saying that you, you not, you, you know, I understand. But how many know sometimes God's asking us to move beyond passiveness to be active? And a wounded healer is someone who is always aware that we are acting out of a weakness that has been made perfect in God's strength. A wounded healer. You and your prayers are part of the rescue, Paul says. 
Huh, I think Paul is saying, listen, you may not have done nothing else but pray for me, but guess what? Your prayers came from a place of woundedness. Why? Because, as Paul says, we all have suffered together. Wounded healers are people who are aware of the collective suffering of the community, not hyper-obsessed with the unique suffering of ourselves. I'm just talking about a consciousness. I'm not talking about you forsaking yourself, becoming a martyr in the cause of helping others. I'm saying that some of us are participating in systems that have trained us to only be concerned about our own well-being. And in being hyper-obsessed with your own well-being, you lose out on the divine design of how wounded healers bind together. Some of that is called a church. Some of that is called a small group. Some of that is called a healing circle. Some of that is called a sister's group, a men's group. Some of that is called a prayer group. But we as a collective, when we spend time together, we start to ask ourselves, what kind of practices can we engage in together? So we can be aware of our woundedness, but also be conscious that we have some active healing work to do. What kind of people must we convene? I often tell folks sometimes it's necessary to be in a group, an affinity group, a group where our commonalities are put at the forefront. So all of the dissonance of our differences do not get in the way of our healing work. So how many know sometimes, you know, it's important for brothers to get with brothers and queer folk to get with queer folk and sisters to get with sisters and black folk to get with black folk and, and white folk and Latino folk and folks to just kind of be in some affinity groups or some cultural groups. Because here in the Bay Area, hey amen, we are the most multiracial region in the world. So, you know, we just got a Bay Area culture. Somebody say amen. I mean, folk be, we be mixing and mingling, and, and, and there's a yay area culture. So sometimes you feel all right being next to folk that have some differences. But how many of you know not everybody is conscience, conscious of your healing work? I don't want to be in a space all the time where I have to defend. Man, I remember when, you know, I was doing my drug and alcohol training work. Hey Amen. And I, I, I was afraid to bring some folk to church. Because, you know, they bring you to church and they just want to, like, cast the devil out of you. Tell you full of the devil, devil, devil. Come on out of that devil, devil. Demon, 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 devil, devil. And they just traumatized. Like, that's my, where, you, where you brought me, where you brought me to. <laughs> uh, how I many know sometimes you need to be in an affinity group where folk won't see the devil in you more than they see God in you? Folk can see the divine design of God in your life. I know I may be different from you, but how I many know God is still working a divine design? God is inviting me to construct a new path of healing and restoration for people who share my same experience. And, and when you can appreciate that God has called me and called you to a divine design of healing and restoration, we won't be threatened by each other's design because we'll realize that this design has come from the divine. My God, my God, my God. What kind of design are you creating for wounded healers to emerge and take place? Can you name the kind of practices, the kind of spaces, the kind of people which make up the third place, the safe space, that extra place beyond work and home? What kind of practices? We're learning about diagnostic behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, meditation, 
practicing the presence of God. We're learning about new kinds of ways to facilitate healing. We're learning it's okay to go to a therapist. It's okay. We live in the Bay Area. And, you know, I grew up here in San Francisco, and it was not until the last 10 years of my life that I've even been to across the Golden Gate Bridge, been to watch sunsets on the mountains, listen to the water. I used to think the bay was just a part of the background. <laughs> you see people running along the water. Oh, that's so corny. Look at them old corn balls walking along the water. All around that dirt and mosquitoes. Look at them. And I, and I, I had to get to a certain place where I realized there's some healing about listening to the rushing water. Uh, what kind of what kind of design are you creating? Some of us grow up in the concrete jungles of Hunters Point, Acorn, the 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 the, the, the Iron Triangle, and we I had young people talking about man I, here in Berkeley. We used to work out of school. We tell them man we want to take you over over, over to, to to the snow, take you up to Tahoe. Like, I'm not I, I don't I don't leave I don't leave Sacramento Street. <laughs> what? No, I'm not. I, no, man. I, I, I'm, I'm 17, and I've never left South Berkeley. I don't, I don't go out of South Berkeley. I said, man, do you see? You could see from South Berkeley water, mountains, the glory of God. But the design that someone else created for you has you locked in to an open-air prison. Not realizing that you are, by design, being cheated out of the very thing that others are coming from across the world to enjoy. Uh, I was I, I, I took some friends around this weekend, and we 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 walking through uh, the Legions Museum in, in the Presidio and and the Palace of Fine Arts and 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 and, and Baker Beach, and you know they they telling me, Pastor Teddy, take me here. I'm like, I don't know how to get here, but I, I'm from San Francisco. I don't know how to get here, but I put it in the put it in the thing, and we stand there looking around. I'm like, ain't this something? My whole life, I've been living in a. <laughs> We, we show up in these places, I, I promise you, half the folk not even speaking English. I think I heard French, and I heard, uh, I heard all kind of tongues that sounded like Pentecost, amen. Folks speaking the good news in their own language. No spirit was there now, no. It was just people, people from all over the world paying money to come and soak in the healing that is within your grasp. I'm telling you now, some of us going to have to stretch ourselves. A wounded healer is somebody who understands that I'm wounded, but I can also take some active steps to be an agent of healing in someone else's life. And then the last thing I'll say, oh, child of God, there's more from where that came from if you put it to work. Put what to work? Well, verse number 10 says, as it turned out, it was the best thing that could have happened to us. For instead of trusting in our own strength or wits to get out of it, we were forced to trust God totally. And I'm one of these people who have come to believe that every trial and tribulation, every hardship, every circumstance must be put to work on behalf of our healing. I don't ever want us to be a people who believe that the trials that come our way are arbitrary or not latent with potential healing and growth. I don't believe that we need trials to grow, but I do believe that trials can help us grow. I do believe that when the trials visit us, we can either allow those trials to collect an unemployment check in our life, or we could put that trial to work. Uh, how many of you got some trials in your life that you're tired of having ride around in your car for free? Some of us uh, are Uber drivers of trials and won't start the clock. We won't allow those trials to have to pay their own way. 
Amen. Now, the reason why I'm not one of these folk who love pets, and I'm not hating on nobody who likes pets, is because I've come to realize that pets don't want to make no contribution to the expenses. Uh, I know some of y'all, this is my emotional animal, and it, it, it gives me, uh, but I need you to bring in something with a George Washington on it. Somebody say amen. Amen. If I got to buy some food, you got to put in on this, man. And some of us are carrying around these trials, and, and we ain't putting our trials to work. Uh, we got this, this issue and this struggle, but we won't put it to work on behalf of our healing. I know coronavirus is a reality, but what are you doing to put coronavirus to work? To make sure that this season of loss and death and grief uh, does not become something that does not turn into an agent of healing and growth in your life. Uh, I'm not trying to trivialize the struggle that we've had to go through because uh, some of us are still going through it now. Some of us are still having to deal with the transitions in our own lives, uh, having to deal with the reality that our loved one may not be there like we thought they would, uh, or having to deal with the mortality in our own body, uh, having to deal with the reality that the fragility of our mind. Uh, uh, leave us often days dizzy and confused. Uh, but I want you to know that there is a way to put your trial to work. Uh, there's a way to put your trial into uh, a place where you can squeeze something out of it. Uh, besides the tears you cry at night, uh, there's more to my trial than the tears I cry. Uh, there's more to my tribulation than the struggle struggle I have to carry yeah. but I believe that God has figured out a way yeah, to take the thing that the devil meant for evil and turn that thing into a potential good yeah. I believe that God has figured out a way yeah, to do for me uh, that thing that others thought was impossible uh, they thought that because I was down uh, that that was going to be my permanent place uh, but they did not know uh, that God was preparing a table for me uh, God was setting up a buffet for me uh, right in the presence of my enemies uh, they thought the trial would break me uh, but God was just introducing me uh, to a little bit of a more healthy diet uh, God said you've been eating too much calories uh, of anxiety and depression uh, so God says I'm gonna set up a table before you uh, in the presence of your enemies uh, your enemies of depression uh, too many calories uh, so I'm gonna to introduce some therapy I'm going to introduce some healing. I'm going to introduce a healing circle. I'm going to give you a divine design that'll help you get back to the place where you thought you never bounce back to. God is trying to help you understand there's more from where that came from. You don't have to worry about running out because the God we serve, he is an all-sufficient God. He is a satisfier. He does everything above I can ask or think according to the power within me. And I'm glad to know that the same God that I've learned to trust fully is the God that Paul says specializes in raising you from the dead. Do I have a witness that knows that God raise me from the dead. It may not be Easter Sunday, but resurrection is still on the way. It may not be Easter Sunday, but God can take the spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and raise us up. I got to rise. I got to get up. You can't stay there because there's more there's more from where that came from. Somebody shout, honey.
There's more. There's more. There's more from where that came from, y'all. Why? Because the divine design of God. It, 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 it's, it's eternal in its construction. It's, it's bottomless in its reach. It's a well that never runs dry. Jesus said it like this, I am the well of living water. Take a sip. Ooh, that sounds like another sermon I need to do. Uh, tell your neighbor, take a sip. Uh, you'll never be thirsty again. And I want you to know that we must put our trials to work. Y'all know I'm a science fiction, you know, person. And I, I was looking at this idea called the event horizon. The event horizon is a boundary in space beyond which events cannot affect the observer. It's like you can be so far away from a thing where it won't affect you, but you are cognizant that it's there. John Mitchell, he goes on to say that the vicinity of these big, massive events like gravity can be so strong that even light will not escape it. I want to tell you that we as followers of Jesus, we got a resurrection horizon. That you can be in a situation, you're close enough to it that you know what's there, but it's too far away where it won't even impact you. To the point where you lose your ability to experience healing and restoration. God's not going to pluck us out of hard situations in order for us to be healed. God will heal us in the midst of our hard situations. Oh, I wish I could take a vacation long enough to outrun the trouble that waits for you at home. <laughs> Amen. I wish I could talk. Some of y'all, how many know you take a vacation and you come back and there's more work for you than when you left? You're like, man, what was the point of this? I left, I had 100 emails. I come back and I got 1,000. What was the point of that? I want these people, I just delete them all. If you want to get in touch, sorry, y'all. If some of y'all be like, man, I emailed Pastor. He never, you didn't email me back. You got to email me back. <laughs> Sometimes you can take a break and come back and you, you, more, you more tired. You need a vacation from your vacation. <laughs> I wish I could talk to somebody. But how many of you know that God can heal us right in the midst of our circumstance? God ain't going to move everybody out of East Oakland. God ain't going to move everybody out of Hunter's Point. God ain't going to move everybody out of Africa and out of Haiti and Colombia and the United States in order for healing to take place. No, God's going to heal some of us, dare I say all of us, right where we are. Why? How? By coming alongside us. And as God comes alongside you, it's your responsibility to come alongside someone else and imagine the chain of healing and restoration that can take place. Oh, come on, we're gonna pray for a few moments. We're gonna invite the healing power of God to connect us one to another. Psalm says, I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away so you can have your way in me. Why? Because God works through us. God works through time. God works through space. God works through creation. And so I want you right now to invite God's consciousness to invade your way of thinking. Where is God needing you and I? to come alongside one another. So here I am, here 
I stand, Lord, my life is in your hands, Lord, I'm longing to see your desire fulfilled in me. We give ourselves away. Come on. Whether you're at home or in the building, say it. I give myself away so you can use me. So you can use me. Give ourselves away. Oh, God. So you can use me. God, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice today. God, I believe that you are calling us into your divine design. It is not by happenstance. It is not by accident. God, I know that the trouble in Haiti, the illness in our country related to coronavirus, the scourge of death all around us through violence and mayhem. God, all of these things plus others are causing great despair among your people. Some of us are reaching for new teachings and ideas to try and make sense of all of the tumult in the land. But may we remember, God, that you come alongside us in our troubles and our trials. We don't have to reach for a new teaching. We can fall back on that which has carried us to this place. That even, God, as we go through the valley of the shadow of death, as we find our faith being destabilized and find our belief being shaken, you are coming alongside us, God. And you are coming alongside us to heal us. Hallelujah. You're coming alongside us to restore our faith. To restore our call. You will not leave us to a place of arbitrary circumstance. But the divine design of you, God, is actively engaging the uniqueness of our person and our gifts. So God, may we design healing. Help us to find groups and comrades and individuals and collectives, churches, prayer groups, couples, Lord God, singles, whoever we need to find. Help us to find folk that can help us, Lord God, make sense of all that is concerning us. And God, may your spirit, the same spirit that Raise Jesus from the dead. May it keep coming to our rescue. Uh, may we cross the resurrection horizon. May we arrive at the place where we know, God, that even though trouble is around me, resurrection is more powerful than the trouble. That though you slay me, God, yet will I trust you. Because resurrection is undefeated in the service of the God of all creation. So bless those afflicted with coronavirus. Bless those, God, who are vaccine hesitant. Bless us, Lord, who are navigating this season, Lord, with our children and our families, at school, at work. Bless us, God, who are trying to make sense of all the confusion and misinformation around us. Lord God, bless, Lord, our families and friends who live in neighborhoods and communities where violence is a daily reality. Help us not to be overcome by fear and hatred of our own children, where we unleash the devil on our own kids, God, for an illusion of safety. God, there is only one way for us, Lord God, to experience healing and restoration is to come alongside one another. So God, be alongside us. Sneak up on us this week. Pop up on us, God. Run up behind us. Run up to us. 
Lord God, and help us to know that, God, you are here with us. Your rod and your staff is comforting us. And we'll say thank you, God. Every person in this place or listening to this message, if you're not saved, I want you to know that God wants to save you. God wants to deliver you from whatever life of sin and rebellion that keeps you from surrendering your life totally to God. It takes nothing more than a decision in your mind, a confession with your mouth, and an open heart. And God says, I'm going to come alongside you in more than just a way to take care of you. I'm going to come alongside you, and I'm going to save you. I'm going to save the most eternal part of you. Ooh, the part that the devil can't touch. The part that sickness can't cripple. God says, I can stabilize your soul. I can anchor your spirit so even though the winds may blow, you will not be broken. If you need to be saved, give your life to the Lord right now. Say, God, come on in. Forgive me of my sins. I accept the work that has been done on the cross. And Jesus, you are my Savior. Save me, heal me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, somebody holler. There's more from where that came from. Yes, indeed. God bless you, people of the way. We love you so much. I pray, we pray that you will stay steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that our labor is not in vain. God has not forgot about us. God has not forgot about you. So be encouraged, and may the blessings of the Lord be yours in abundance.